A problem with direct cache mappings is that every single address in memory can only ever exist at one particular location in the cache. This creates a problem if you want to use two different memory addresses that map to the same cache address. You'll have to keep evicting one from the cache to read the other one in and go back and forth, which is very inefficient. Associative and set associative cache mappings get around this restriction by allowing individual memory addresses to be mapped to multiple possible locations within the cache. Before talking about these cache mapping schemes, I'll talk briefly about content addressable memory. Content addressable memory is a special type of expensive static RAM that allows you to look up the address of particular contents in memory. So in this example here, if I were to feed in the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then the CAM would simultaneously compare this value against the contents of all of these addresses, and then it would output a value of 2, because 2 is the address, or maybe line number, where those contents occur in this memory. An associative cache mapping uses content addressable memory in the following way. As in the previous video, our memory addresses will still be 24 bits long. Similarly, within any given cache line, the last two bits will refer to the particular memory word or byte within that line. But what is now different is that we use all of the remaining bits to specify the tag. So we have a 22-bit tag used for looking up a given memory address's contents in the cache. As a consequence, the amount of storage required for tags in the cache is much greater. And keep in mind that this particular type of content addressable memory is also more expensive. So not only do we need more of it, but it costs more per bit. However, the benefit is that if I have a memory address like this one, I can separate the first 22 bits from the last two bits to get a tag of zero and a word of two. And what I do is I feed the tag of zero, 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 zero into the tag portion of the cache and the content addressable memory responds by saying that line 3FFF contains that tag and therefore I can use the word portion to figure out which of these memory words I'm actually addressing. And so since the word is 2, a 0 would be the 5-5, five five, a 1 would be the 3-3, three three, and a 2 would be the 1-1. One one. So the particular byte that I would retrieve would be 1-1. One one. So we already know that these are the contents in memory starting at address 0. Let's fill out some more memory contents based on the contents of our cache. The next highest tag that we can see in the cache is the 0140AA. So that would appear somewhere down the line here. However, keep in mind that we have two bits for the word at the end of our memory addresses. So we have to shift this tag over by two positions to find out what the corresponding hex value would be in the address here. So if we take the original tag value in hex, expand it into binary, and then shift over by two, we get this hex value. So that is the memory address, and the contents of memory at that address come from here. And just a reminder that this particular hex address only refers to the byte 98, and if that 8 were changed to a 9, I'd be referring to the BA. If it were an A, I'd be referring to the DC, and if it were a B, I'd be referring to the FE. 
the next highest tag in the cache that we can see is this 300FF0. And if we write that out here, expand it into binary, and then shift it over by two, we get this hex sequence, which is the next address we'll write down. And this particular address refers to the 1,4. And as we increment this hex value, we move through the remaining bytes from right to left. The last tag we see in our cache is this 3FFFFF which is actually the highest possible tag we can have because if we shift that over by two, we get the sequence FFFFFC and the highest addressable byte in memory would be all Fs, so in binary, all ones. But the reason that we end in a C is that of course we're referring to a four byte sequence here. Regardless, this address would be all the way at the bottom of our memory down here. So we have F, 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 C, and the contents of that address come from this location. And in particular, this address refers specifically to the 7, 1. And if I change the C to a D, it's this 0, 0. If I make it an E, it's this 0, 0. And I make it an F, it would be that 0, 0. And so that is how we refer to memory using an associative cache. But as I said before, the problem is that this tag section is too big. So what we need is a solution that's a compromise between the storage efficiency of a direct mapping and the speed efficiency of an associative mapping. In a set associative cache mapping, the cache is broken up into a certain number of sets of equal size we'll use S to denote the number of sets. Each set contains the same number of lines, L. So set zero here has lines zero through L minus one. Memory is broken up into chunks of size S. So this first chunk has S number of blocks and every memory address in this chunk would have the tag zero and the next chunk goes from s plus 0 to 2s minus 1. So this is the second chunk, and that would have a tag of 1. This next chunk would have a tag of 2, etc. So within a given memory chunk, the first line of that chunk, here all shown in red, can map to any of the lines of the first set. So remember that there are multiple lines within this set here. So this particular block of memory could map to the first line, the second line, the last line, any of the lines within that set. Similarly, this one block could map to any of those lines. And then the second line in each of these chunks could map to any of the lines in the second set. So all of these green lines are potentially in set one, all of the red lines are potentially in set zero, and then down at the end of each chunk we have set S minus one, and so any of these blue lines could be in set S minus one. So once again this one block could be at that line, or that line, or that line, or that line, any of those. Of course, this means that each of the given blocks in memory has multiple places in the cache it could go, but it also means that you have to figure out which of the given, say, red lines, for example, is at a given cache line. So the way we do that is with the tags. So this drawing is not to scale, but what you can see here is that the first line in the cache, which is in set zero, has a tag of zero. That means that it is this particular block of memory. 
However, the next line in the cache is also in set zero, but its tag is a one. Therefore, it must come from this block of memory. So in this example, each set is a distinct associative mapped cache. The way I actually decode a memory address and check for it in the cache is I first look at the set number, which is part of the memory address. Specifically, a memory address consists of a tag, a set number, and a word number. So I look at the set number first to figure out which of these associatively mapped caches I will look at, and then within that one associatively mapped cache, I use the tag number to figure out which line I'm going to retrieve. So I'm checking fewer lines of the cache on each memory access. Then within a given cache line, I can use the word number to find the word that I need. However, instead of implementing my set associative cache by using several associatively mapped caches, I could instead implement it as several parallel directly mapped caches. Such a configuration is known as a k-way set associative cache, where k is the number of distinct directly mapped caches used in the configuration. Here, the individual sets are spread out across the different directly mapped caches. So we have k distinct direct caches, and this block zero in this memory chunk zero could be the first line of cache zero, or the first line of cache one, or of any of the other caches, or the first line of cache k minus one. In terms of implementation, the way this approach works is that if I want to look up this memory address, I have its tag, I simultaneously check the tags of all of these caches, and at most one of them will have the tag zero here, and once I know which directly mapped cache has the tag at that specific location, I know to retrieve that cache line as opposed to this one or this one. Similarly, if I were looking for this particular blue line down here in the block of addresses with tag 2, I would simultaneously check that tag, that tag, and that tag. At most, one of them would have a value of 2, and I would know to retrieve the contents from that particular cache's line. If I wanted to read this line, which has tag 1, and I checked all of these tags, and none of them had a 1, then it would mean I'd have to read that value from memory and put it into the cache, but I would be able to put it into any of those three locations. This k-way approach is generally only sensible if the value of k is small. Keep in mind that k is the number of different locations that any given memory address can potentially map to. If you want each individual memory address to have more available locations it can map to, then the approach using several distinct content addressable memories is preferred.